Two years ago, we began a profile of Johnny. Three days after we started, he backed out. Last spring, he agreed to let us try again. And we did. Why are you doing this now? Doing what? This. You walked out on us once before. Didn't walk well, out I, on us. I understood that you're paying me a large amount of money for this. You're wrong. <laughs> You I mean, why are you doing this now? I, I'm not running a boiler room operation. I have no phony real estate uh, scam. I'm not taking any kickbacks. Uh, I did steal a ring from Woolworths once when I was 12 years old. And I think that's why you're here. We're doing this because you're a national treasure. <laughs> that's what they tell me. Well, you're a national treasure. And you know what the dollar is worth nowadays. <laughs> Carson lives like his peers among the entertainment elite in Bel Air, California. Though his two-acre spread could almost be described as modest compared to the more lavish establishments that dot the neighborhood. Nonetheless, isn't it over the head a little bit of a Nebraska boy? I don't know. Well, look, it's a yard. So this is not a big yard. That's right. It's, it's not a big yard. It's comfortable. It's nice. I like that. The fact is that he and his wife, Joanna, are among the more low-key, unaffected residents out there, with none of the flamboyance that Hollywood can sometimes spawn. Johnny spends most of his time at home, alone in his office, working, reading newspapers, writing, with his awards and mementos scattered about. His beloved drums close by, and tape jazz, always in the background. It was here that we sat down to find out what is Johnny Carson really like. Well, there's a stereotype of Carson. You know there is. Well, what, is it? what is it? It is ice water in his veins. I had that taken out years ago. So I went to Denmark and had that done. It's all over now. Shy. De defensive. True. I can remember when I was in high school. If I pulled out my old high school annual book and read some of the things, uh, people might say, oh, he's conceited, he's aloof. Actually, that was more shy. See, when I'm in front of an audience, it's, it's a different thing. Why? I'm in control. That's a key to Carson, control. Professionally, he insists upon it. Socially, he can't demand it, so he retreats. He's uncomfortable. And the fact is that he is shy. There's Carson, the performer, and there's Carson, the private individual. And I can separate the two. A day in the professional life of Johnny Carson? The morning is given to reading half a dozen newspapers and magazines, looking for grist for the mill of that evening's monologue. He is a man of habit. And at one o'clock, the family cook, Lisette, gives him lunch in a brown paper bag. Then into the garage and his Mercedes sports car for the 40-minute drive to beautiful downtown Burbank and the NBC factory. No chauffeurs, no entourage. Someday your prince will come. Five minutes after he arrives, he sits down with Fred de Cordova, the Tonight Show's producer and his good friend, to talk about that evening's guests. She is going to talk to a turtle, a bird, a dog, and a cat. This is our normal opening. Normal up. opening guests. That's right. And that's, uh... She talks to... She thinks they actually talk to her. Well, she, you can't say mind reader, but no. she's an animal analyst. Mm -hmm. Gets in the mind. Well, she's on the right show. She's <laughs> animals, right. After she finishes with the turtle, will you have her go talk to the staff? <laughs> Dangerous wild animal. At about ten past five, his sidekick, Ed McMahon, shows up. <laughs> Dangerous wild animal. I never liked to take a guess before. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this for? That's for the show tonight. We have a lady who's going to analyze these cats. I never meet the guests before the show. <laughs> I know, it's a mistake. She won't do the show unless she meets you first. Well, <laughs> look at that. Okay. Yeah, incidentally, these people are from 60 Minutes, and they want to know about the finances on your house. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Ed, you once said, some nights he doesn't have it. Something may have gone wrong in his life. I try to pull him out of it. Yes. Explain. Well, uh, he's had a couple of uh, marital problems along the way, as we all have, and... Uh, when he carries those with him into the studio, you can feel it. Um, one night we were on the air, and I know he's particularly upset about a personal problem, really upset. And he didn't want to do the show. He didn't have it. He was like kind of fighting with himself, but he knew he had to go down and perform. So I left him, knew he was in that mood. He got down, and he started. He did the monologue. It was all acceptable. He got to the desk, and now he had a chance to relax and not really get started. And you may have seen nights when it, it looks like he's playing around with things. He doesn't want to bring the first guest out. He wants right. to do something else. So I looked at him and I said, oh, 
Your eyes are really dancing tonight. And he said, what? I said, your eyes are really... Of course, they weren't dancing. But I got him started. I said, Don't, they're dancing. He said, what do you mean they're dancing? I said, well, look at them. He said, well, your eyes are dancing. And that was the whole thing. You know, we did seven minutes on our eyes are dancing. But that changed his mood, and the show was fine. Do you get sensitive about the fact that people say he'll never take a serious controversy? Well, I have an answer to that. I said, now, tell me the last time that Jack Benny, Red Skelton, uh, Benny Comedian, used his show to do serious issues. That's not what I'm there for. Can't they see that? But you're not... Why do they think that just because you have a Tonight Show that you must deal in serious issues? That's a danger. It's a real danger. Once you start that, you start to get that self-important feeling that what you say has great import. And you know, strangely enough, you could use that show as a forum. You could sway people. And I don't think you should as an entertainer. <laughs> He studies tapes of old shows at home, for Carson is a perfectionist and a very competitive man. Yeah, there are hazards in that, of course. There are good qualities about it and there are bad qualities. I mean, being too competitive, I think, sometimes is, is a bad thing. Uh, I don't think it's, it's being competitive in your work is so bad. I think if you get too competitive in other things outside of your work, uh, that can be a hazard because then you might not enjoy them as much as you should. It's like going out and play tennis. I found that most celebrities, especially in the public eye, have a far greater opinion of their game than their actual talent. They like to think they play better than they do. The man speaks the truth. Nice return. He's only played the game for four years, and it shows. But he is earnest about it. What, are you waiting for your pacemaker to start? I think it's got to kick in just about when you serve. He says he uses tennis, which he loves, as a kind of therapy to help get rid of his aggressions. And that goes double for his drums, a gift from Buddy Rich. Some people say that it helps you to work out your hostility. Sure. It's true. Sure. It's like beating something. That's all it is. You're going to take this up, Mike. You've got a lot of hostility. I'd rather beat on you. <laughs> if there is one almost universal comment from the guests who have appeared on The Tonight Show, it is that Johnny is a gentleman, a kind man. And by and large, that is true as well with the way he treats people in his nightly monologue. Are you reluctant in putting together your monologue to go hard on a guy? Only when I sense the mood is, uh, and which you can do from an audience, and I'll give you a perfect illustration. Um, when Wilbur Mills had his problem with the famous Fanny Fox in the Tidal Basin and so forth, it was amusing to most people, and you could do jokes about it. I stopped doing jokes immediately as soon as the people found out that he was an alcoholic and had emotional problems, and in fact, uh, was dependent on alcohol, then I think that would be a cheap shot to take, and to still do jokes about it. So I immediately ceased doing jokes about that, because it, it was really unfair. Of course, it takes one to know one. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> cruel. You're cruel. There was a time. What? Come on. Th there was a time when... Uh... I used to have a little pop. I sure did. That's right. I don't handle it well. You and McM... Really, you don't? I don't handle alcohol well at all, no. Really don't. Oh, Ed and I have uh, had some wonderful times in the past. You know what Ed told us? What did Ed tell you? <laughs> he told us that from time to time you were going to take on the whole Russian army. And, <laughs> and you didn't have the bazookas to do it. That's right. No, that's uh, one reason I found that it was probably best for me to not really entangle with it. I just found out that I, I did not drink well. And uh, when I did drink, Rather than a lot of people who become fun-loving and gregarious and love everybody, uh, I would go the opposite. And it would happen just like that. <laughs>